when retired art teacher Sean Doyle took a summer job as a security guard at the Hudson Bay Company in downtown Calgary, Alberta. He had no idea that the position would bring him face to face with notorious serial killer Charles Eng. In 1980, Charles Eng met future conspirator Leonard Lake. Just a few years later, in 1984, after serving 18 months in military prison, Eng rejoined Lake and the two hatched a plan that they entitled the Miranda Project, inspired by the 1963 John Foles novel The Collector. The Collector tells the story of a man who captures a young woman named Miranda and keeps her as a slave in hopes that she would eventually fall in love with him. Under their Miranda Project, the pair would kidnap women as slaves and keep them trapped in an isolated dungeon at a remote cabin near Wileysville, California, in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Lake and Aang began a crime spree which included rape, torture, and murder, wherein they killed men and children, but kept women alive, torturing them before eventually murdering them or allowing them to die from their injuries. Life as I'm living it is boring. The challenge of this project, the excitement, the thrill if it succeeds, even the exciting experience if it fails. It's something that I fantasize daily about. The purpose of that cell will be the imprisonment of the young lady. Their rampage went on for the next year, and might have gone even longer if it weren't for Aang's kleptomania. On June 2, 1985, Leonard Lake and Charles Eng entered the South City Lumber Store in South San Francisco. An employee observed Eng stealing a $75 vice and called the police. When confronted by the employee, Eng tossed the vice into the back of a 1980 Honda Prelude in the parking lot and then fled on foot. When the police arrived, they looked in the car's trunk and saw the stolen vice along with a 22 caliber pistol equipped with an illegal silencer. Lake exited the store, however he was arrested for the illegally modified weapon and taken to the South San Francisco Police Station. On arrest, the officer noticed that Lake didn't bear a resemblance to the driver's license he was using, and research showed that it was in fact the driver's license of Robin Scott Stapley, a San Diego man who had been reported missing by his family several weeks earlier. And when officers ran the Ponda vehicle, they discovered it was registered to Paul Costner, who'd also disappeared from San Francisco on November 2nd, 1984. Under the passenger seat of the vehicle, police found a utility bill belonging to Lake's ex-wife with a Wileysville address. When police entered the cabin at that address, they discovered video equipment in one of the bedrooms, as well as a bed drilled with holes in the posts. Next to the cabin stood a cinder block bunker, which had been constructed by Lake in his teenage years. Inside the bunker, investigators found tools, handcuffs, women's clothing and makeup, along with pictures of 21 different women. And posted on a wall was a list of typewritten rules for female captives to follow. Behind one wall, equipped with a hidden door, was a tiny windowless cell with a small mattress and a bucket that might have been used as a toilet. Investigators believe that the cell had been used to hold women prisoner. In a makeshift burial site nearby, police unearthed 45 pounds of burned and crushed human bone fragments, corresponding to a minimum of 11 bodies. They also found two buried five-gallon buckets. Inside the buckets were envelopes containing the names and identification of the victims. They also held Lake's handwritten journals and videotapes that had been taken by Lake and Eng, documenting the torture of their victims. On one of the tapes, Charles Eng is seen talking to victim Brenda O'Connor as he cuts her shirt off with a knife. You can cry and stuff, like the rest of them, but it won't do any good. We're pretty cold-hearted, so to speak. In another part of the tape, Kathy Allen is seen seated in a chair with Leonard Lake warning her. If you don't go along with us, we'll probably take you into the bed, lie you down, rape you, shoot you, and bury you. 
Well in custody, Leonard Lake watched as police started to piece together their investigation. After writing a letter to his ex-wife, he swallowed a cyanide capsule that he had hidden in his jacket, slipping into a coma and eventually dying days later. Meanwhile, during the investigation, Eng fled to Canada where his sister lived. For a period of time, he lived near Calgary, Alberta, undetected, in a handmade lean-to in Fish Creek Provincial Park, until his final fateful run-in with security guard Sean Doyle. On Friday, July 5th, 1985, Sean Doyle arrived at his job at the Hudson's Bay Company with no idea of what lay ahead. Joking with a fellow co-worker, he bet them $10 that he could catch a shoplifter. Later that day, while patrolling the bottom floor of the Hudson Bay Company, which sold food items, he happened to spot Charles Eng. Eng was trying to sneak grocery items, including a bottle of Pepsi and a can of salmon, into his bag. Doyle confronted Eng as he started to leave, flashing his badge and taking hold of the bag of stolen goods. Doyle had no idea that he had a serial killer in his grasp, but moments later he found out just how much danger he was in. As Eng pretended to fumble with his wallet, Doyle's partner cried, He's got a gun! Doyle reacted quickly, kicking Eng's feet and shouldering him to the ground. The pair wrestled on the department store floor trying to gain control of the weapon. Eng began to knee Doyle in the back of the head and bit Doyle's left wrist down to the bone in an effort to get him to release hold on the gun. Meanwhile, a crowd of onlookers grew and two old ladies sat watching and clapping, believing it to be some sort of show that the Hudson Bay Company had put on for the stampede. Somehow, Eng managed to get his finger around the trigger of the gun. The first shot missed Doyle, but in a desperate attempt to avoid being shot, Doyle placed his hand over the barrel of the gun. A second shot went off, tearing through Doyle's hand and permanently paralyzing three fingers. Fueled by a taste of adrenaline, Doyle pinned Eng to the ground until Calgary police arrived on the scene to make an arrest. After the arrest, Eng was charged and convicted of shoplifting, assault with a weapon, and possession of a concealed firearm. He was sentenced to four and a half years in prison, but after serving his sentence, he remained incarcerated pending an extradition request from the Californian authorities. In September 1991, following a lengthy legal battle, the Supreme Court of Canada granted the extradition, and within an hour, Eng was put on a plane back to California. Once there, he was charged with 12 counts of first-degree murder. Throughout the lengthy trial, Eng made every effort to stall, delay, and generally undermine the process. He sued the state over his temporary detainment in Folsom Prison, where he was caught hiding maps, fake IDs, and other escape paraphernalia. He also lodged a long series of complaints regarding the strength of his eyeglasses, the temperature of his food, and his right to practice origami in his jail cell. He ended up going through a total of 10 different attorneys, sometimes filing malpractices suits against them citing incompetent representation, and was allowed to represent himself which delayed the trial yet another year while he researched applicable laws. The trial finally began on October 1998, seven years after his extradition from Canada. Despite the video evidence and information found in Lake's diaries, Eng maintained that he was merely an observer and that Lake planned and committed all of the kidnappings, rapes, and murders unassisted. At one point during the trial, Eng even managed to obtain the phone number of one of the jurors and contacted the juror at home in an unsuccessful attempt to cause a mistrial. Despite all of these tactics, Eng was finally convicted of 11 of the 12 homicides in February 1999. We, the jury in the above entitled case, find the defendant, Charles Cheetat Ng, guilty of the murder of Harvey Dubs as charged in count three. We further find the murder to be of the first degree. This included the murders of six men, three women, and two children. These convictions were enough to sentence Eng to death, and the presiding judge rejected a motion to reduce the jury's verdict to life imprisonment. It is the order of this court that you shall be punished by death. <laughs> Said penalty to be inflicted within the walls of the California State Prison at San Quentin, California. 
At the completion of the trial, the cost to the state of California was approximately $20 million, which was at the time the most expensive trial in the state's history. As of July 19th, Eng remains on death row at San Quentin State Prison for the murder of 11 individuals. However, it's believed that the actual number of victims was much higher, with Eng and Lake's Miranda Project resulting in the murder of over 25 men, women, and children.